<coughs> All right. And the part of the chapter we're going to focus on here in Matthew chapter 12 is kind of right in the middle there, starting in verse number 31, where he goes into the uh, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Now, what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is the speech that we use and the words that we use. And the, the title of my sermon is Choose Your Words Wisely. And we started off in Matthew chapter 12 because I just want to draw attention to the importance of words and what it can do. And this is, I mean, you think about how loving and merciful and long-suffering God is and how you could think in your own life of all the sins that you've committed, all the things that you've done against God, all the things that you've said, all the things that you've done, yet He's forgiven you as a believer in Jesus Christ, Amen. right? And you think about how, how great that is and how wonderful that is. But there are people that can become reprobate, that can become rejected by God, where that forgiveness is no longer available to them. One of the ways that this happens is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Look down there at verse number 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. All manner, all manner of sin, all manner of blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now what's blasphemy? Blasphemy is speaking, well, we'll get into this specifically, but blasphemy is things that you do with your mouth, with your words, right? And we'll see that this is obvious here. Which is why, again, I'm, I'm starting off with this to choose your words wisely because they can have a serious impact in your life. You say, yeah, but they're just words. Words are very powerful and words carry a lot of weight and a lot of meaning. And the things that we say oftentimes can be even worse than the things that you do. Or better, depending on how it's used. Right? Your words can have a lot of influence, a lot of impact. And here we're seeing blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. He's, the Bible says that's never going to be forgiven. Verse 32, And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That is just something that does not get forgiven at all. The blood of Jesus Christ does not cover the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Verse 33, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment." You're saying every idle word, all the words that people say just in passing, you don't even think about all the stupid things that people say, you know, all the words that these atheists just rail against God and the dumb things they say and when they rail on other Christians, all these idle words and the things, and just think about even yourself, you know, the things that you say just in general, he says, <coughs> every idle word, you know, men shall, they'll give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now, Thankfully, as, as Christians, we don't, have, we don't give account of our words. Once you're saved, you're forgiven. Your sins are not going to be mentioned to you again. But here he's referring to those people who are evil trees, right, that bring forth the bad fruit, that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, and all their idle words, all the wicked people of this world, all the little things that they say, it's going to be brought back up to them and they're going to be judged by that and they're going to remember and, and wish they had never said the words that they said just idly in this lifetime. Verse 37, For by thy words thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So if you have the words where you called upon the name of the Lord, you're justified. And those are the only words that will justify you and otherwise you will be condemned. But the, the weight and the importance given to the words that we speak here is great. It's huge. It's very important. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 3. <clears throat> now, this blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, I'll just mention it real briefly. What I believe this is even talking about earlier in the chapter, 
in verse 24, the Bible says, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And you can look in the other Gospels where this, this story is, is referenced and the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, and you'll see the same thing. Because Jesus starts responding right after that. And, and, and he gives his whole response here. And he talks about blasphemy and the Holy Ghost. And I believe the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is by these people saying that the power of God and the things that Jesus did when he was casting out devils and they could literally see the work of, of Jesus Christ and the work of God and the power of God through him. For them to just say, oh, he's doing that through the power of Satan, through the power of the devil. It's just that that is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. They're not recognizing the power of the Holy Ghost and they're saying that it's exact opposite of where it's coming from. It's not coming from God, it's coming from the devil. And I believe that that is the unforgivable sin that they committed then. But James chapter, I just wanted to mention that real briefly because a lot of people get confused about that and wonder like, oh, if I blaspheme the, the Holy Ghost and just wondering if they're, you know, if they're reprobate and giving up. I doubt it, but but the things that they were saying were, <laughs> were very important and, and held a lot of weight with God and God heard their words and is going to judge them by their words. Look at James chapter 3, start in verse number 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. He's saying if you don't offend anybody with, your word, with the words that you speak, he says you're a perfect man and you're able also to bridle the whole body, which bridle means control. You're able to control your whole body. If you're able to control your mouth so much that you don't offend anybody, he says you're able to control your whole body. Verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. So he's saying, you know, in a horse, they, they've got those... Those bridles that go over their, their mouth and over their face, and there's a bit in there, and you pull on one side, and you pull on the other side, right? This is the example that he's using. And you can control which way the horse is, the whole body's going to go. You know, if you want to lead them this direction, you just yank a little bit this way on the bit that's in their mouth, it's going to turn their head that way, and they're going to go. And he's likening the control that you have over your own mouth. If you're able to control your tongue that way, hey, you've got control over your whole body the same way that, you know, the, the horse does you have over the horse. Verse number four, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. And he's using another example here of a, of a huge ship right out in the sea. And you've got these massive forces. You've got the forces of the waves and the forces of these mighty winds that are, that are all acting upon this ship. And he's saying the way that you control which way you steer it's just a real small helm. You've got this little rudder, right, in the, in, in the wheel that you could turn the rudder one way or the other. And that one little, little piece of the ship controls where the whole thing goes and where all the force is, is projected towards. Verse number five, even so the tongue is a little member. Your tongue is very small on your body, a small part of your body. And boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Your tongue is a very small portion of your body, yet it can do great damage. It says, "Behold, how great a fire, a uh, uh, how great a matter a little fire kindleth." And you think about uh, you know every forest fire, all these you know we have these these great forest fires out here in the Prescott area, and they all start from just one small little fire. You know whether it's a lightning strike starts one small one tree on fire, one small brush fire. I mean cigarette butts can start these great massive wildfires, right? One little bit of, of fire being thrown out there can just engulf an entire forest and, and really do a lot of damage. Verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell." For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. 
This is something that probably needs to be preached more often in churches in general about the things and the words that we speak because they are so powerful. And we could see all of the, the very vivid examples that he gives here of a horse, of a ship, of a fire, and, and applying all of those to our tongues. We need to make sure that we're not flippant about the things that just come out of our mouth, that we're not real quick to speak. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, you don't have to turn there, stay in James. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. He's saying the fool is going to be the one just blabbering their mouth about everything. You know, people who can't keep their mouth shut and that just want to tell you about everything in the world that's going on in their life, everything that's running through their head. You know, a, a thought pops into their head and they just open up their mouth and start speaking. The Bible refers to a person like that as being a fool. And in verse 20, the Bible says, Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? That means he's quick to speak. There is more hope of a fool than of him. And if you read through Proverbs especially, you read about fools. There's not a lot of hope for fools, is there? I mean, the Bible talks about them, you know, the fool needs a, the, the rod on the back and stuff. That's, that's, uh, there's, there's so many negative things with, with being a fool. And he's saying, if you're hasty with your words, if you're just real quick to speak, there's more hope of a fool than of you. Why? Because your, your words can do so much damage. And the things that you say, once, once the words exit your mouth, once they go out, you can't, you can't call them back. It's already been said. The, you know, the damage could already have been done if what you're saying shouldn't have been said. Now, we look at how important words can be, how, how either beneficial or damaging they can be. We saw in James chapter 3 how damaging they can be and, and how the you know, tongue is a, is a world of iniquity and it's, it's set on fire of hell. But words can also be very good. Obviously, the Bible talks about God's word, God's holy word being sharper than any two-edged sword. Right? That's his words. God's words, the Bible says, are truth. God's words are life. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of God's word. So the words that God has bring life. They bring everlasting life to people. Again, through his word. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You don't, you don't get your salvation unless you hear God's words. And that is how important and, and how, how great and life-bringing those words are. The words that are spoken are, are extreme. I mean, they're more important than the actions. Being able to hear these words. Flip over, if you would, to James chapter 1. You're in chapter 3. See, we need to have a filter on our mouth. At the, the, the things that come through your mind, you need to be able to stop before the thought actually becomes verbal, before the thought comes out of your mouth. <coughs> if people can apply a filter, there'd be so much... <laughs> your, life, your life, personally, would be so much better if you could apply a filter to your own mouth. And, not, and really think before you speak. Don't be hasty with your words. James chapter 1 says in verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. He's saying you ought to be able to, to, to be ready to listen. Be swift to hear. Swift means fast. Be ready to just to listen to what other people are saying, but be slow to speak. Take in the things that you hear. Take them in and wait and absorb it and analyze it and think about it and be able to make a rational decision on what you're going to speak in response if a response is necessary. We all ought to be ready to listen. Do you ever you run across the people from time to time that they never want to listen? Right? They just always want to do the talking. The people want to be the center of attention. They want to be the ones talk, 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 and everyone else listen. And as soon as you try to get a word in edgewise, they just, just talk over you and they don't want to listen to what you have to say. That's a fool. We ought to be swift to hear and slow to speak. 
I don't have the, I, I didn't put the verse down in my notes, but the Bible says that even a fool, when he holdeth his tongue, is counted as a wise man. So even if you're already a fool, if you, if you live a foolish life and you're a fool, if you could just hold your tongue and not speak so much, people will at least think that you're wise. People will at least think that you're not a fool <coughs> because you're not demonstrating how foolish you are by just opening up your mouth and blabbing away. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians 3. Let's go backwards from James to Colossians chapter 3. So all of the scripture was, was really just designed to kind of show you the importance of our words and, and, and how weighty they can be and what the Bible is demonstrating as being, as, as laying the level of importance on our speech, our communication, on the things that we say. So now let's go a little bit deeper into, you know, what things do you talk about with people? I mean, think about the, the conversations that you have. When you talk about things in general, what are you talking about? What are the words coming out of your mouth? Are they good words? Are they right words? Or are they filthy and are they, are they abominable in God's sight? Are they, are they things that, that a Christian ought not to be talking about? Look at Colossians 3, verse number 8. The Bible says, But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and ye have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The Bible says we need to put off, it says all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, Filthy communication out of your mouth. Is your communication filthy? Are you talking about things like, you know, I know um, whether it's a, a group of men or a group of women get together, especially maybe in the workplace or around people, you know, outside of church, the conversations can oftentimes turn very filthy. Maybe it's a joke. Maybe someone's, someone's saying something and, and it's a filthy joke. Or maybe it's somebody talking about the bedroom with other people. First of all, you ought not to be participating in that communication at all. And God forbid you would be the one speaking those things to other people. There are certain things that just ought not to be said. If it, you know, I'm, I'm talking now to, to married couples. You know, when you, when you have problems at home, when you have issues, whether it be, you know, issues with your, with your spouse or especially, you know, something that's going on in the bedroom, those are not things that you just talk about with other people. The Bible says that, that within marriage, you know, the bed is undefiled, that everything's fine in marriage, but don't be bringing other people into your marriage in that sense and talking about things that go on. That becomes filthy at that moment. That is filthy communication. <clears throat> but not only should you not be speaking these things, you ought not to even be participating by hearing and being part of a conversation. There are certain conversations that people are going to be having and you just need to be like, walk away, you know, tactfully, however you want to do it, just make sure you are not going to be participating in that. However, you, however you, you remove yourself from the situation, you need to do it so that you don't get caught up in the filthy communication out of others. And then, the, and then the, the verse continues on here. It says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Proverbs 12.22 says, Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. <clears throat> Telling lies. Again, another thing that you can do with your mouth, a sin that you can commit just by speaking. Another reason to, to hesitate, to not speak so quickly. Oftentimes people will lie out of fear. Out of fear of being caught for something. Out of fear that you've done something wrong or you want to cover up what you've done. Don't be so quick to answer. Especially kids. Kids are, are famous for this. They know they've done something wrong. They know the consequences of what they've done wrong. They don't want to face those consequences. So what's the easy thing to do? The easy thing is to tell a lie. The easy thing is just to say, oh, I didn't do that. Oh, that wasn't me. 
But the Bible says that lying lips are abomination to the Lord. Now, abomination is a very strong word. It's not that God is just slightly displeased with people who tell a lie. Abomination is God hates it. God wrathfully hates lying lips. People who just tell lies, who do not speak the truth. Proverbs 26, 28 says, A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. So think about that. Not only does God hate it when you tell a lie, but the Bible says that the person that you're lying to, you hate that person. The person that you're lying to, the Bible says a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. Anybody who, who is in the receiving end of your lie, whether it's because you're gossiping about someone else and lying about them, you hate that person. You also hate the person you're lying to. You don't respect them enough to tell them the truth. You're lying to them. Remember that the next time you tell a lie. Kids, remember that the next time you want to lie to mom and dad. The Bible says that if you're going to be lying to someone, you hate them. And I'm sure you wouldn't say that you hate your parents. But according to the Bible, you do if you lie to them. Flip over if you would to Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> you're in Colossians. Just go back a few pages to Ephesians chapter 5. Proverbs 26, 28. 26, 28. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Ephesians 5. Just a few pages back from Colossians 3. <clears throat> Ephesians 5. <clears throat> Getting back to our conversations with people. Filthy communication, right? Ephesians 5, look at verse 11. The Bible says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. <laughs> reprove them means tell them that they're wrong. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. The things that the wicked people do in secret, we shouldn't even be talking about those things. If you remember when, when I was preaching my sermon on the on the the old-fashioned entertainment and the values and stuff of the 50s and in, in America, of all the things that they wouldn't even put on the TV screen. Why? Because they believed, like this says, it's a shame to even speak of those things that are done of them in, in secret. Look, just because things are done in this world doesn't mean that it's just, well, it's happening, so let's just talk about it. You can understand that things are going on. You can understand what wickedness is, but you don't need to just be talking about these things and going into detail about these things. And this is actually one of the, one of the verses that, that convicted myself. Because, <clears throat> you know, I, I like to watch documentaries and, and things that are truthful, you know, not just all the lies from, from the world. I don't watch the Hollywood movies and stuff like that, but there's certain documentaries I like to see that I think are interesting. And I've completely stopped watching anything that has to do with, like, I used to listen to these or watch these, these documentaries on serial killers. Because a verse like this, I don't need to be hearing the things that, that they did and the graphic details of how they, you know, the things that they did to people that literally would make me sick to my stomach. And that's something that, that nobody ought to be listening to. And it's, the Bible says it's a shame to even speak about those things. It's a shame for the people talking about that stuff. And we ought not to be just letting that just come into our minds and even thinking about those things. Ultimately, it will desensitize you. But look, it's a shame to even speak about those things which are done of them in secret. We ought to be careful about the, the communication that we have and the speech that we use. We need to keep ourselves pure and undefiled. <coughs> but besides that, I think about the entertainment industry. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. The entertainment industry is by and large made up of reprobates. It's made up of, of sodomites. It's made up of homosexuals. It's made up of people that hate God. It's made up of people that want to have nothing to do with God, that blaspheme God. That that the 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 work the the um, the fruits of their work is anti Bible. It's anti Christian. It's anti God. It promotes sin. It promotes all kinds of wickedness. 
And these are the people, look at Romans chapter 1, the very last verse there, verse number 32. Now, keep in mind, this is, this is still in reference to the reprobate, verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This is talking about the Sodomites, that not only do they know that the people who do these things are worthy of death, that they do those things themselves, but they also just take pleasure in, in, in other people, other reprobates are doing the same thing. That is specifically what the verse is talking about, but I think you can apply that to yourself as a Christian also, saying, if God feels so strongly about these people and God puts a death penalty on the things that they do, should we be taking pleasure in their filthy actions and the things that they do and, and what they promote and who they are? Should we be taking pleasure in the sodomites that, that put out their movies and put out their music and just be taking pleasure of these people who are worthy of death? And I would say no. I don't think, I don't think it's right at all. I think that the, the wickedness of, of who these reprobates are, you should be taking no pleasure in the things that they do and the music that comes out of their heart and, their, and their, the, the art that they display, whether it be in the movies or in, you know, in whatever it is that they do, we should be taking no pleasure in the works that they do. No pleasure at all. And we definitely shouldn't be speaking about them. Talking about the whatever is going on in Hollyweird and, the, and these, these actors and actresses and all the things that are going on in their lives. It's disgusting. Turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 3. I know there's a lot of scripture today, but there's a lot of scripture about this topic. 1 Peter chapter 3. The things that you spend your time with will be the things that you end up talking about. However you spend your day. You know, however much time you spend at work, that's probably going to be some of the things that you're talking about even when you're off of work because you're spending so much time there. Thank you. <coughs> Other things you do outside of work. Whatever, whatever you do for fun. You know, we were talking about real briefly this morning how we went yesterday to the, uh, to the Game and Fish Expo, the outdoor thing. You know, the, the thing that we spend our time doing, that's what we're going to be talking about when we fellowship with other people, when we get together with other people. Those are what we're going to be talking about. And likewise, if you're spending a lot of time with church, hopefully that's going to be a lot of the things that you spend your time talking about also. For instance, when you came in this morning, you're asking, hey, how, how is so-and-so doing? How is this person doing? Because you care about that because you're, you're invested in that and that's what you're spending your time with. Keep that in mind. If you catch yourself talking about things that you shouldn't be talking about, trace that back. Where is that coming from? Where is that communication coming from? Why do you care so much about whatever it is that you're saying? If, you, if all of a sudden something comes out of your mouth and you realize, wow, why, why in the world am I talking about this? Why is this even... A thought. Why, why, am I, why am I bringing this up to mention to anybody? And then think, why is it? Why, what, what is it that you're doing? What are your actions that are, that are bringing these thoughts into your head that you're now they're coming out of your mouth? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 8 says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love is brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. We ought to be able to refrain our tongue. That's showing Control over your tongue, refraining your tongue from evil, from speaking evil against people and your lips that you speak no guile. What's guile? You're deceiving people. You're lying. You're covering things up. You're, you're, you're not speaking truthfully. 
James 4.11 says, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. We ought not to be speaking evil of each other. You know, just, just talking bad things about each other. <clears throat> the Bible talks about busybody. Sorry, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. We ought to be speaking evil one of another. And not just speaking out loud, but even in written form, you know, now there's, there's, we live in a digital age. You can speak things online through typing them out, right? You type things out on Facebook, you type out comments on YouTube, you type these things. We ought not to be speaking evil of other people and just speaking evil one another, whether it be verbally or whether it be typed out. I just want to bring that, because that, I believe that applies to everything that we're talking about today. Don't think that it's only with your mouth. It's only with your lips. It's also the things that you, that you communicate, that you write out. We're not supposed to be speaking evil of one another. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13 says, And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. And this is talking about widows, that the younger widows, he's saying they're going to they're gonna end up, that's why he, he's, it's God's will that they get married again, get remarried. Because what's going to happen is they're going to learn to be idle. They're not going to have anything to do. And they're going to be wandering about from house to house, getting involved in everyone else's business, being tattlers, right? Telling on other people, going and spreading gossip and rumors. And it says in busybodies. What's a busybody? It's someone that's, that's re being real busy spending their time in other people's matters. And not for their benefit, just getting involved, right? Just getting involved in everyone else's business. It's one thing to esteem someone better than yourself and to help them out and to do things to help them. It's another thing to be a busybody. That's just getting involved for no reason at all. And it's going around from, from house to house and just talking about everything that's going on in everybody else's life and speaking things which they ought not. The Bible says in Proverbs 26, you don't have to turn there. Proverbs 20, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 5. Proverbs 26, 20 says, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. Just as much as you need wood to, to keep a fire going, right? You're around a campfire and the fire starts to get low. What do you do? You add another log in there and it's going to keep on going. And if there's no more wood, that fire is just going to burn out. It's going to die. It's going to be gone. So when there's no tail bear, what's a tail bear? Someone who's just going around and telling stories and, and telling people, you know, what's going on with everyone else. When that person is not around, the strife ceaseth. Why? Because that person just, just stirs up fighting and strife and conflict between people. Did you hear what so-and-so did? Did you hear what so-and-so said? And it gets around. And honestly, you know, our church is real small, so we don't have a problem with this right now. But as the church grows, this will be an issue. Guaranteed, because this happens, and I think it is about every church. And we need to make sure that individually, all of us, we keep this straight in our mind and we keep a control of our tongue. Because there will be people, the more, the bigger the group gets, the more people that are together, the more there's going to be people gossiping about other people. It's kind of a, a natural tendency to sin. But it's a sin that can cause a lot of damage. Sins like that can, sh can split churches. Literally. All the gossiping and all the talking and getting involved in people's business. If it gets bad enough and people you know, just allow themselves to participate in the tattling and the busybodiness, instead of rebuking it as soon as you hear it. You know, and that's a response that you have. If, ever, if someone ever comes to you and just wants to, to tattle, and bring other matters that you know that they shouldn't be talking about, you ought to let them know. Now, it may be uncomfortable. You say, I don't know if I could do that. You, you ought to be able to do that. Because that's what that person needs to hear. You say, you know what? You ought not to be talking about those things. I don't want to hear it. 
Don't be talking bad about other people. I don't want to hear it. If it's something that's so major that it needs to be brought up to the church, then handle it the way that we saw already in 1 Corinthians, the way that we deal with, with major issues and major problems within the church. But usually these things are not major issues. We're talking about someone doing something that other people don't like or, or, or I saw so-and-so at the bar or I saw so-and-so doing this or doing that or whatever, you know, and just gossiping about people. I saw so-and-so come out of the movie theater. Okay, so what good does that do to anybody else that you're just talking about that person behind their back and just trying to bring up their sin? Would you like it if, God, if, if someone else were just bringing up all of your sins to somebody else? Is that going to make you feel good? Is that going to edify you at all? Actually, turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You can keep your finger in Matthew 5 if you want or whatever, but Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 verse 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers that's what we should be doing with our speech the, th the things that we, sh we say it should be good to the use of edifying building someone else up when you're tattling when you're talking about other people what are you doing you're not building them up you're actually tearing them down you say I can't believe so and so did this and bringing up someone else's sins. You're tearing that person down. You're not lifting them up. But here as a church, as brethren, what are we supposed to be doing? Encouraging each other. Helping one another. Edifying one another. We ought to be speaking good things. Matthew chapter 5, one of the things that we could get ourselves in trouble with as far as speech is concerned, something on a completely different track, a whole separate point, is making vows and making promises and saying things. When you, when you make a statement or when you make a promise, you ought to be careful with the words that come out of your mouth that you are prepared to follow up on whatever it is that you say. Oftentimes people make empty promises, right? Oh, I'm there for you whenever you need anything. I'm there to help you out or whatever. And then all of a sudden someone needs something and you're like, oh, I can't help you out, right? Now look, if you're not going to do something, don't make the promise. A lot of times people want to make these promises because it makes them look good in other people's eyes because they sound really great. But when it comes down to it, they're not going to do anything. Don't be that person. That's a sin. That's wicked. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, Jesus said, And ye have heard that it hath been said of them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. He's saying, do the things that you say you're going to do. If you make an oath, if you make, you, know, you make that statement, do them. But I say unto you, swear not at all, Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. So he's saying, you know, you've heard before people would, would make an oath. And they'd make this vow. They'd, make, they'd swear. They'd swear, you know, by, the, by God's altar, by the holy altar, right? What they're saying is true. Or what they're saying they're going to do will come to pass, right? They're trying to, to add some weight, even more weight to their words. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. He's saying, don't, don't swear at all. Don't swear by this, by that. Don't swear by the heaven. Don't swear by yourself. Don't swear by anything else. And swear doesn't mean like cussing. It means making an oath, right? Swearing a vow or an oath. He's saying, don't do that. He said, just let your communication be yay, yay, nay, nay. Which means, if you say yes, it's yes. If you say no, it's no. You don't have to bring anything else into this. 
And this is why a lot of people don't want to swear on the Holy Bible. You know, when you, when you go into court and ask you, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, or nothing but the truth, so help me God, right? And you put your hand on the Bible. I think it's a good thing not to do that because Jesus just says, look, don't swear by anything. Don't swear by God's holy. Don't swear by anything at all. He just says, but let your communication be yay, yay, nay, nay. You know, if, it's, if it's yes, it's yes. If it's no, it's no. But you don't have to swear by anything at all. You ought to be taken at your word because the things that you say are true because you don't lie because the, you actually put weight on the things that you say. You care about the things that you say so that people don't have anything to hold against you. We ought to be very clear with the things that we say. I'll just read this for you from 2 Corinthians 3.12. Bob reads, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. The things that you speak, the things that you say, make them easily understood. Make it, make it very clear what you say. As a church and as a pastor, I try to be as very clear as possible about what I'm teaching, about what we believe, that there's no question about it, that there's no, no I don't know exactly what he's saying. No, we're very clear about things. We use plainness of speech. And you know, obviously, and honestly, that's an attribute, a quality that you ought to be able to use just in your life in general and the things that you speak. Turn if you would to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. The Bible says in Colossians 4, 5, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So the things that we say, our speech, they ought to be with grace. What's grace, right? It's, it's like forgiveness. Being gracious unto other people, but seasoned with salt. So we need, the, we need the salt of God's word to be there. And, um, but we use, we use grace with our speech. So Titus chapter 2, verse number 7. We're almost done. Titus 2, 7 reads, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Look at verse 8. Sound speech that cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. The enemy is going to be watching the things that you say. Another reason to be careful about the words that you use and the speech that you use and what you're talking about, what comes out of your mouth. We ought to have sound speech. <coughs> speech that's grounded and founded in the truth. It's sound that cannot be condemned. So that the things that you say, someone's not going to be able to bring up later and be like, well, so-and-so said this and condemn you for it. Now, if you're speaking the truth, if you're speaking the God's word, you're speaking the Bible, people might try to do that anyways, but you could say it's the Bible. It's God's word. It's not my word, right? And the world's going to hate it anyways. They'll try to condemn you for it. But you need to make sure that the speech that you use can't legitimately be condemned because you said something wicked. You said something false. You were bringing down another brother in Christ. You were tattling. You are being a busybody. You are saying something and not following through with it. You're not being true to your own words. You're lying. We need to make sure we have sound speech that cannot be condemned. And it says that he that is on the contrary parts of the people who oppose us, that they could be ashamed because they won't have anything evil to say of you. They won't have anything to say against you because the words that you speak, they're truth, they're grounded, they're sound, they're, they're true, they're, they're founded in God's word, and there's nothing they can say. It's like Daniel, right? The, Daniel was promoted to be the, the head of basically everybody else. He was only underneath the you know, Pharaoh or whatever. He was, he was only underneath the king. But he had, he had power and authority over everything else. And the other people that were real close to his position, they hated him for it. And what did they try to do? They tried to come up with anything that they could against him, and they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They couldn't find any fault with Daniel. Why? Because he was a godly, righteous man, and the things that he spake were true, and they were honest, and they were right. 
And he used sound speech that could not be condemned. Everything coming out of his mouth, they couldn't find fault with it. So the only way they could come up to find fault with it was the way that he served God. And they, they knew that he would obey God rather than men. And that is the way that we ought to live also. Daniel's a great example. Last place I have you turn, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10, last, last scripture we're going to look up. This subject's very important. There's a lot of, there's a lot of areas that we can, and I kind of covered a lot of ground too, where we could get into trouble with the words that we speak. One, you could be making a vow that you don't keep. For instance, a vow of marriage, right? You make an oath, you make a promise, you make a vow, and you go back on it. Now you just commit a grievous sin because you said something now and you're not doing it. And that makes you a liar. And we saw how God feels about lying. You can be talking about things that are filthy. We can be talking about things that, that shouldn't even be spoken about, about things that other people do in private. You can be a tattler, a busybody. You can be bringing other people down with the words that you use. When the Bible says that we ought to be speaking things that are good for edifying, that are good to, to lift other people up. But with all of our using control over our mouth, with, with all of these reasons to be able to be slow to speak, we ought not to be afraid to speak the truth and to speak what's right and to preach the gospel. That is one area where you ought to be able to, to open up your lips and, and let them keep speaking about Jesus Christ. Matthew 10, verse 24. Matthew 10, 24 reads, The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So Jesus is saying, look, the things I tell you in darkness, the things that, that you receive from God late at night when you're reading the Bible or early in the morning, and the things that you hear when you're just at home, when you're all by yourself, he says, those things speak in the light, speak in the daytime, speak out to as many people as possible. What you hear in the ear, those little things you hear, it's just something that you get. He says, preach ye upon the housetops. God wants his word proclaimed. But see, here's the thing, and this is why we read this whole section in context. He refers to people that, he says, look, you can expect people to be calling you names and, and to be opposing you when you preach the word. He's saying, but do it anyways. If they've called the master of the house, they called him the devil, they called Jesus the devil, how much more are they going to call you things? And see, the problem is people are too, too quick. If you speak the wrong things, if you speak the filthy things, if you speak about other people, you know what? You're going to be completely accepted in the world out there. No one's going to come at you or say you're doing wrong out in the world. They're going to invite you in. It's going to be real comfortable. You'll fit right in with the world. And you won't have any problems with the world and they won't have any problems with you. But it's sin and it's wickedness and it's wrong. God will have a problem with you when the world is accepting of you. But he says, even though this is going to go against the world and you will experience, you know, people coming against you for this, they've called me the devil. So what, how much more are they going to call you? They're going to call you way worse things. But I want you to preach it anyways. He says, don't fear them. The only thing that they're able to do is kill the body. He said, don't, don't fear them. That's the worst that they could do unto you is just, is just put you to death physically. He says, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's who we need to fear. We need to fear our Father in heaven and say, you know what? I'm not going to fear what other people are going are to say because of my speech, because of the things that I'm saying. I'm going to fear God. 
I'm going to obey my I'm going to obey God the Father. <coughs> Tongues of fire, a world of iniquity according to James chapter 3. We need to just constantly put our mouth in check. And the best way to do that is just to, to try to teach yourself to just not be so hasty in your speech. The easiest way to, to be hasty is when you're upset. You know, don't let your emotions take control. When, you, when you're in a fight, when you're in an argument, you need to be able to filter the things that you say. A lot of hurtful things are said through when there's arguments, when people's emotions are charged up and, and you know, you're getting involved in these, in these arguments and these fightings. We need to be very careful because the words that you speak, I mean, they, they stick with people then forever. They can stick with people for a very long time. And when you say hurtful things, we need, we, I mean, it's like a sword. You know, the Bible talk about God's word being a sword, but I mean, just, just taking that and slicing someone. And that's oftentimes why people say nasty things because they know that they're going to hurt. But don't let your emotions dictate if you're going to say something like that. Because you need to understand the ramifications of saying something like that. And if you're married and you have fights like that, hey, you're a brother and a sister in Christ. You're brethren. And we ought to be able to say things, even if you're angry with one another, I understand what it's like to be angry with one another. Put the filter on your mouth. Don't speak the things that you're going to regret later. You can't take things back. You can't undo what's said. You can't... You can't Fix the damage that's done by the words that come out of your mouth. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the great instruction that you give us from the Bible. Lord, I'm sure that this is something that everybody has to work on, uh, being able to filter our mouth and, and be able to control the things that we talk about and the things that we say. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to put a filter on the things that we allow to come into our lives because we know that the things that we, that we hear that those are the things that we're going to speak, the things that we allow ourselves to, um, to let into our, to our life, the, the things that we put in front of our face, whether it be video or audio or, or just communication with other people, dear Lord, all of those things that come in are going to be the things that we talk about. Help us to be able to <clears throat> control what, what comes in so that we're not just allowing a bunch of sin into our life, and that we wouldn't have filthy communication out of our mouth, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.